I'm thinking about care and caregiving and people who are taking care of us and what about curators? Are they taking care of artists? Are curators caregivers? Are curators necessarily have to be nurturing? And this is something I wanted to start with. These are the, some of the topics that I would like to investigate further. This notion of care of the self, but basically it's care how you engage with the world. And it's, you know, we are today standing in a quite artificial pose. Uh, I am holding a mic and standing like, a, and I am dressed in a kind of Greek way, a la Greca. Uh, because I wanted like to have a nod to this care of the self and I think it's uh, you know playfully evoking uh, ancient masters of thought what do you want to do I want to do sh show on caring you know it's just like who cares the question <laughs> like that can be like cynical who cares but then I said you know it's a care of the self in relationship to contemporary art but uh, it is actually, you know, I, I then, you know, because I'm in, like, a, in my, my arsenal is intellectual, right? This is my practice. Then I start spinning, you know, then I started spinning uh, ideas. Uh, uh, what's that care for me? And I'm using, you know, this mobilization and our response to it as a disarmament, as a, you know, I, I did not invent it. You know, I kind of paraphrased Peter Sloterdijk, who wrote in a, a kind of early on um, in the 80s uh, about that, you know, uh, mobilization, and he called it, um, he called uh, his essay um, Ptolemaean mobilization and Copernican uh, disarmament, saying that there is an, uh, you know, this kind of eternal mobilization of technical progress. And so technical progress or, you know, consumerism, say what you want, but, you know, eternal process of, of mobilization here, you know, in liberal, in liberal capitalism, in market, in like all these things. And then disarmament, you know, how Copernicus disarmed the, you know, the, the worldview, right? He managed to change radically perspective and to take away the, the earth from the center. So what are these possibilities of disarmament? Going back to the care of the self, because care, if care of the self does not exist, how possibly you, you can uh, you know, extend it, you have these ripples? That's like I, what I'm trying to say. And that care of the self can be misinterpreted as this like, you know, American right-wing uh, cult of individual and has nothing to do with that cult of individuality. Mm -hmm. You know, I am my fortress, I don't need anything else. On the contrary, this like, care has to be reconstituted, disarming these, uh, wrestling away these ideas of, you know, of selfish individual. Yeah, or perceiving care of the self as that self in relationship with others. And you made an interesting point earlier about talking about caregivers in the society are also really devalued and they're lower paid and we don't um, recognize their work. And I think that part of the reason for that is because caregiving is so separate. Like we see this as a separate industry. It's not like caregiving should be part of our individual daily lives of every single person on this planet. So what I see is that that institutionalization of care is, um, that's what creates this separation. And that's what, that's what creates like a lack of responsibility um, in, in everyone else because it's someone's job and they're getting a paycheck to do that. Um, so I don't really need to do that. Um, but I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to do with some of my projects is intervene in a way that parallels some charity services, but is separate from that um, because I'm an individual, like I'm an artist, and I'm bringing this project in, and I'm doing it um, not as a business model. So that's another kind of entrapment, a charity entrapment. Right, but you you wrote to us, you know, when we had like this kind of initial exchange, how you know how artists are uh, like forgetting or like misconstruing like constructed ideas of, you know, if you do social practice that somehow you are not going to, you, you're not going to 
like expect any reward other than like well, doing good. Well, yeah, so and that's also the, that's the fallacy. Also, right? a lot of grants. So there's there's grants that you can apply for as an artist to do some work that is engaging a community. And the one stipulation of this grant is that you can't pay yourself. <laughs> so it's like you can run your project, you can get materials, but if you pay for yourself, you're suddenly not the altruistic kind of artist on the pedestal that you're supposed to be. So yeah, that's a fallacy because obviously, I mean... We and how you're going to make a sustainable a living, that right. means that like a charitable artists can only be benefactors, meaning that they're like independently wealthy. Yeah. So if right. you're independently wealthy, you're and allowed you make... to be, you know, patron uh, or, a, you know, an artist. And this is like the, the you know, the most uh, problematic, you know, uh, aspect of, of capitalist mobilization you know so if you have capital you're allowed to do whatever and to and to be right. you know, so I, I don't know like how you disarm this kind of system like in your own work how do you like how do you work <laughs> with it you know and so, so you um, like I think by distribution of uh, distribution of power in a different way or di distribution of um, of decision making so I think that having like a horizontal participation in projects. Can you just say like that. for if if anybody did not uh, you know hear before like what's your your what's your latest project uh, because I was you know I was uh, uh, amazed you know how how it uh, it's not about you know like you know do like do good kind of feel good work but mm -hmm. it's about beauty. Right. Yeah. It's like beauty and goodness. You know. So like, can you just tell us you know like. How did you make it happen? Um, well, so my last project was a mobile beauty salon or a mobile hair salon that visited homeless shelters and provided hair services for free. Um, and those were given by volunteer hairstylists that were licensed stylists coming from salons, coming to volunteer their time. Um, so in, in a way, this is not a service, obviously, that's... Um, supported by Department of Homeless Services is not federally funded. Um, yet it is a real overlooked need, I feel, um, with just being able to have the privacy and the means to uh, present yourself the way you want to appear to society. And, um, and the project doesn't pretend to solve homelessness. You know, it's, it's a really simple gesture that is, has a different focus. So it's mostly focused on, um, on unraveling a social stigma. Mm -hmm. So it's create, it's a small, it's like a truck that's built into a salon. So it's a small um, space that is more geared toward creating a human to human contact between, and dialogue um, between the participants and, and just creating a space for like intimacy too. Um, so the stylist is also a caregiver, you know, they're, there to make their clients feel cared for and, and touched and engaged in a conversation. And if you're homeless, you get that less than anyone um, because of a lot of stigmas. So that's kind of in a nutshell. Yeah. That care of the self is, uh, you know, is uh, really uh, open for definition. That's why I kind of like it. We are not applying some kind of model. It really is what you, what you as an artist need as a space of freedom. Is that like a studio practice? Is it post studio practice? Is it like you know renouncing the studio, or is it like you are delineating your kind of a place of freedom and like not kind of you know making these transactions? And uh, and I wanted to talk to, to Kate about that, uh, you know, that kind of positioning of, you know, self-representation and like, and care. And uh, we, we had like serious of, of these discussions and like you want to talk about like how is it, how, it, how your practice is informed by these ideas. So I'm going to bring it back a little bit to the Foucault that you had cited in talking about it because it's such a broad thing and an expansive thing for me that I find having points is um, a reference like that are, are helpful. But um, as you were just talking about freedom and also renouncing something, and I thought there was an interesting um, moment in one of Foucault's later interviews where he talked about freedom as opposed to liberation, and that liberation, of course, is necessary uh, for practices of freedom, but that freedom is a practice. 
um, with standards and an ethical structure to it. Um, so, uh, but so in my work, um, I am in it a lot of the time uh, now in videos. Uh, I do these field experiments out in landscape and um, I am a tool of measure myself. And it was something that I hadn't really, um, I hadn't been as presently obvious in my work until um, that time that I started doing this work. And so I, I started recognizing myself as a site of projection and a site from which to project. Um, how do I even, I don't know if it's really even relating to what we're talking about, except it so explicitly does for me. Um, one of the things that, uh, that Jody was talking about, I think, too, is this institutionalization of care. And something Foucault talks about is institutionalization of care that would normally be something you would do for yourself, like medical or psychological or you know, dental, what have you. And to have this more holistic approach and this breaking down of categories is something that I'm really interested in. Um, because when I, I feel like when you take those things on for yourself and you get to a point of knowing yourself um, is when you can see and begin to know others as well and resonate outwards. You know, uh, um, let's start this conversation and uh, it does make sense because it's like perpetuated in your practices. Yeah. Like, it's like how you, you know, how you approach things and like, you know, it's not about like, you know, making a, a work and that is kind of end result. The yeah. work is just, you know, kind of aspect of that of that being in the world or practice. I really appreciate that you said that um, because it is does feel like a rolling, uh, rolling along rhythm. And um, Frank and Tracy and I were talking about this a little earlier, in that um, these rhythms have manifestations at certain times, um, which is to say, my work is particularly interested in this resonance amongst things in the landscape this intersubjective perceptual reciprocity, but that's not to um, dis-distinguish the individual entities in that landscape. And so as one entity within a landscape of many, um, and that landscape being a fluid one, how are, how are we all um, manifesting on each other? and how do you vibrate within yourself. Um, and again, in Foucault's later interviews, one of the things he says is the care of the self is really begins with the knowledge of the self as a point of freedom and, um, uh, and practice. So, um, so the more I've gone into my own subjective self, um, and embodied that in my work, the more expansive I feel I've been able to be. Um, so, for example, um, by interviewing um, women that, uh, that had grown up on the same land that I had um, for generations, um, and just thinking about how do they sound having run through the same woods that I ran through, how do I sound in relation to that? How do they have a conversation with each other? How do they have, how might they have had a conversation with the land? Conversation being a category um, that we might say is wrapped around talking, but there are different ways to have conversations, you know? And I, um, uh, I don't know, by pinpointing certain ideas that I have about how I may have been structurally formed by a landscape or an environment and how they may have been structurally formed by a landscape and an environment and how we then harm, form a harmonic, you know. Um, I think it's interesting because each, each note in a harmonic is its own self. 
a vibration, you know. Can you talk more about like how you know, like knowing yourself, like because this is something that you're talking about is a private, solitary action, or is it like knowing yourself through your relationship with others or in the world or your relationship with the with the earth, like you're talking about? That's a good question. I think it's, I think it's, I guess that's the crux of the question, right? That's the that's the pebble dropped in the center of the to make the circle ripple rippling mm-hmm. outwards, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But like also acknowledging other other ripples too um, from pebbles being dropped. Um, but I do think for me, just just very straightforwardly, um, the more I've gone into very specific things and very specific ideas to myself, the more, um, for example. I'm going to walk up and down this hillside over and over at different rates of speed, videotape it. It's me. It's the hill that I ran up and down uh, a lot as a kid. Um, It's the same one. It happens to be the same one that these women were running up and down as however many other people, however many other deer and squirrel and whatever, leaves falling down. Um, But let me just... I am the thing that I have control over, I guess, and I am the thing that I can speak to from inside of it. Um, so how am I kind of trying to get some data on that um, then relate to other things? Does that make sense? You know, I, uh, you know, I want to switch the, the theme now to, you know, to this kind of a close collaborations what if like you have like uh, you know you, you drop two pebbles at the same time <laughs> and like and you make these like uh, you know concentric ripples that are kind of uh, you know like a like a, how would you say this like a Venn diagrams when like you know they're um, you know like they're not com- you're not like one being like but you're self expanding in a, in a couple uh, in an artist uh, 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 Collaborative, as uh, as a you know, kind of how do you call it yourself? Like artist couple, or like pair, like a duo. I don't know, like no, no, duo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, you know, we are. Or we have become or one. Permanent, permanent working organization. <laughs> you know? Permanent working unit. I don't know. No, like, I mean unit. I mean, I think that's just it. I mean, we're permanent unit. Uh, you know, we've been making work together now for almost a decade. And married for almost a decade, and every and we realized that we, you know, in terms of just keeping the conversation about caring. Hey, yeah, you're here like not to you know like not to kind of say oh it worked for us like but like no, really to no. to show us how negotiation of like this care of the self works when you're like uh, when you are making things together and like kind of a, uh, approaching the world as you know as a united front how does that work how do you fortify how you empower that's what we like how you know yourself within the couple and and i know by knowing you and your work that that's functioning so you're here to tell us how it's like you know how how is it like when it's uh, you know when it's successful these you know disarming uh, uh processes there are so many interesting things that we could speak about within this this dialogue that can probably go on for hours but What I found most interesting was earlier in the conversation when you started was ethics being a constant. And and to me, it it is, and self-care is a constant. It's like an involuntary emotion. It's like the beating of the heart. And there's levels of of self-care, right? There's luxurious levels of self-care, and there's um, like just primal levels of self-care. And it it runs the gamut of all types of socioeconomics and demographics. But I think something that is inherent with a lot of of people, maybe it's a humanistic thing or animalistic thing, is after you reach the comfort and that involuntary level of self-care, you you have this burning desire to have that same passion and share it with another another person or to see what happens when you uh, bring another person or another human being into your into your life and and how how that changes that self-care and how that changes the beating of the heart and it's it's not a 
like I'm not trying to make it a, like a super cheesy thing, but it's, ha it's it's negotiation, it's tension, it's two human beings who are completely different, no matter how similar they are, and that friction, and what happens when that friction is right? What happens when those two pebbles drop and our ripples are sort of in sync with one another? And then also just you know, again caring, caring for us also equals sort of sharing. And like sharing in, in a way that like as artistic practice, as a marriage, I mean like again, like it's all one. Like it like and then the work is a byproduct of those things. Which is, you know, if we go back to the Venn diagram, the middle is the byproduct. Which, you know, that then equals sort of like all these breakdowns of negotiations, the sort of like deconstruction of I think all the things that, that sort of make or break sort of like how humans then disperse sharing. You know, we, you know, we think about Foucault, I think also for us, Foucault has been huge, you know, in his essay of heterotopia, like, at least for me, like, the biggest sort of um, thing I got from that essay was about space. It's, it's crucial to all of our practices, whether it's an internal dialogue or a dialogue with your friends, and for us, that dialogue n never ceases. It's always ongoing, which is one of the reasons why we continue to collaborate. Yeah, and and like to go back to sort of sublet, you know, we lived in a, lived in and around ple in people's places via sort of Airbnb, friend to friends. So we photographed these objects, and again, like these objects then hold the value of care for these homeowners. So again, like caring is sort of like a very huge thread in the way we live and the way we share our work. Because then, like you know, how the only way that people can relate to these sort of what. Uh, photographs or I guess objects that we make is that then they have to remember their own lives and then they have to go back into their own history banks and figure out does it then relate to their lives or not. Uh, your work is a, is like about you know this like uh, connected effort of, of life that brings you know that, that like uh, you know it brings the work to the surface but it's like how you lived uh, that project together and then Julie's work for me was uh, at least the ones that I saw so far was about you know this like uh, uh, kind of uh, delegated performances like in video like delegated you know like she delegates people to, to work for her so you know how do you situate now you know within this notion of care of the self when you work with others mm. and for I mean it's it's like is it like for yourself or for others is completely moot point, you know, like that you like we do, uh, you know, we do engage others. So, so like if you can say something about that, like when you, um, when you work with and you, and you know, like it's not necessarily that you had different like uh, uh, works that are not necessarily um, participatory, but I would like to hear about that. Uh, you but know, you, you say I delegate, it's maybe not, it's precise and not precise in the same time. Yeah, but like, you know, it's like, like to, it's interesting to jump into the conversation this way because like, to me the studio is a platform where like, the studio can exist if there is a true everyday care of, of myself because I'm the one who entered the studio so that's the first step mm -hmm. right and then so there is this and from there I can like I dare not to say like that I can trigger a vision so how it works it's like I have an image that I want to reach because it makes sense in, in the world and it's coming here very much like a painter or like it's it's like comes like a conviction that it has to be and after I will start to think often about someone, some specific interpreter, which is to me an individual, someone that gravitates around my mind. And often I will start to make a sculpture to enter the, to connect with the material world. The ethical uh, uh, constitution of the self or, you know, kind of, uh, Perform, it's like a performative notion of freedom that has to be performed as a practice on a, every, what did you say, like heartbeat or like waking moment or, you know, this is why I like the idea of, you know, in a mobilized world, 
what we can offer. And this is not only, you know, feminist, but it's a, all feminine, is that like a nurturing approach and disarmament. So I am, you know, I am not saying we go, you know, we go with the flow, right? Like we are like accepting of everything. No, we are radically, uh, uh, you know, ready to transgress, question, uh, uh, rebel, you know, or, you know, like, or, or you know, Criticize positive politics in itself carries that you know the, the readiness for change and re willingness to you know like to constantly you know question everything and you know and to act upon it. But you know I saw it and you know and, and thank God you know it makes me feel better and like in, and, and makes me hopeful that this disarmament call it however you want in your practice is like it's a you know it, it's a it's a possibility you know like you're you're disarming uh, all the you know all the you know. Uh, violence that is coming our way or something that is uh, given as an entitlement as you know you mentioned the background being an outsider being you know uh, uh, well it's it's hard for us to say we are an outsiders because we are here sitting comfortably <laughs> you know we are not the dispossessed and disenfranchised let's not be cynical but to a certain degree you know not feeling that and like that we you know we are entitled and like, and we don't feel frustrated about it. You know, that's also something that's important for me because I don't have the place of power. You know, like I will, you know, jump at that power because I want to grasp it. On the contrary, you know, like I'm saying, you know, like I, by disarming these impossibilities, I find places of, of action. And my action is like, just like being able to hear you. That's what I had to say, basically. We are not interested in criticizing uh, usual circumstances, your usual ways of uh, of doing business, status quo, perpetuation, or however you call it. Uh, we wanted to uh, propose a way that is uh, caring. Uh, my idea of uh, late capitalist mobilization is not something that you know that they are like a beast to be tamed. I saw that as a possibility of uh, proposing disarmament. And disarmament is, uh, yes, it's related to liberation, but it comes, you know, separately. You know, disarmament is a, a radical active participation in the art world, uh, in these uh, testimonies by artists, that they are negotiating obstacles in uh, different ways, but what they share in common is that willingness to you know, to disarm impossibilities or, you know, unsustainable uh, models of behaviors and, and actions. So I am, you know, I'm empowered myself when I see that, like, how they make things happen, how they negotiate uh, and their own practices. And this is for me, you know, caring, um, giving care, taking care, and also receiving so much uh, uh, back from, you know, from that, uh, involvement. So this is a lesson for me, and I am, and I'm grateful that we uh, shared it together here. I'm caring. <laughs>